So I was asked uh, to talk about calves and heifers a little bit. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to move fairly quickly. I will um, share my slides. Um, if they haven't been shared already, I will make sure that Dave has them so he can distribute them. And if you want a copy, just email me. My email is right there, MEV1 at Cornell. Okay. And uh, I'll get my slides moving forward here. So a little introduction, goals and objectives. Talk about nutrient requirements related to weaning, weaning and starter intake and composition. And I'm going to talk a little bit about slowing the process down. And um, again, in a 45 minute talk, I can't give context to all this stuff. What I'll say right now is I think we've been working on this weaning thing for a long time. We want to blame high levels of milk and milk replacer intake for the problem. And I think the real problem is not that. I think the problem is we don't put the right starter in the front of the calf and we, we want to go too fast. All right. Rumen development takes time and we've been wanting this kind of rapid system but maybe we need to change the nutrient supply to them. And then I'll, I'll do a couple of things about later um, stages of growth around pregnancy, late pregnancy, because I see that as a, a place where a lot of dairies are losing what I call marginal milk. And I'll explain that and then we'll summarize. So, you know, I like doing this anymore. Again, I'll do this quickly. What are your growth objectives for your calves? And, you know, I've been doing this work now with my grad students for what seems like a long time. It's a long time and it's not, but this is Rodrigo, who's also my co-author. He just finished his PhD in our program and uh, is now working in Canada. And um, this is one of his calves. Rodrigo was brilliant with calves. He loves calves. He loves the managed calves. He loves the nutrition of calves. He just loves calves. Um, and when he finishes a study, he always takes a picture with his favorite calf to remind him of the study and everything else. So this is not the fastest growing calf on the study. This is just Rodrigo's favorite calf. But I think the numbers here are pretty interesting, right? And I think it causes us all to stop and think about what we should be expecting um, in our growth. And, um, you know, this calf weighed 340 pounds at 91 days and averaged about 2.9 pounds per day from birth. Okay, that's really fast. Uh, that includes through the weaning phase. So what this tells us is these guys have a lot of opportunity to grow. They have a lot of capacity to grow. We just have to figure out how to put the nutrients in front of them and manage them accordingly. What I find really interesting about this is that this calf is already one to two months younger on age at first calving because of this growth that it doesn't have to achieve uh, to get pregnant, right? We've, we've decreased the amount of time in their non-productive phase. And I think that's really important when we think about a systems basis because some people will say, geez, you had to feed it a lot of nutrients to do that, that's expensive. Well, yeah, it is expensive. Um, and there's no two ways about that, but it, it should be thought of as a return on investment, not just absolute cost per day, all right? And I think that's where I get frustrated after all these years, because I'll have people say, well, it's going to cost too much to do that. Well, yeah, but if you ever, <laughs> ever stop to calculate your return per unit of gain, the only way to make that cheaper is to dilute out your fixed costs, which is your maintenance. So just like anything else, okay? So... We can grow them fast. They can be great calves. So, you know, real quick, what should be our overall objectives to that point? Optimize heifers, optimize profits by obtaining the highest quality heifer at the lowest possible cost, usually in the least amount of time, right? Younger heifers are more productive heifers. Younger heifers uh, at calving uh, reduce our overhead cost and also reduce the inventory we need. And that, that leads us to the idea that we need to focus on return on investment. And, you know, we can do it prior to weaning, we can do it up to pregnancy, but I think we should do it over their productive life. Um, because at some point we have to think about, you know, if we invest $2,200 in raising a heifer, how long does it take her to hit zero? And then how much longer does it take her to actually make us some money? I'm not going to do all those calculations today, but I think that's when you sit down and plot that out, there's a lot of heifers that never cross that zero line. So they don't 
ever pay themselves back. We want to minimize the non-completion rate, and that means all the animals that are born and, and either never milk or finish a lactation. These are all things we've been talking about for a long time, but I, I, see, I see heifers that don't make it to lactation or don't make it through weaning, um, and we accept some of that, but that inflates the cost of the rest of our system. They weren't free. Right. And then we want to optimize the productivity of the animal over their productive life, manage them for their genetic potential starting at birth. Right. And I'll talk about that. So so genetic potential. Right. And this is um, I threw these slides in uh, based on some other things that I've been doing. And, and again, it's it's not entirely out of context today because Corwin's going to touch on some of this. But uh, a few years ago, you know, I, we you know, we had for years we had Bob Everett here who would help all of us think through genetics and productivity. And Bob and I would spend a lot of time talking about genetic potential and what turns it on and what doesn't and how much is innate and how much, you know, nature versus nurture, right? And um, I don't have Bob here anymore, but I'll reach out to people like John Cole and Chad Deckow and ask them how they're thinking about this. And, you know, 10 years ago, John Cole published a paper that said, hey, the genetic, you know, boundaries for Holstein's you know, about 11,000, so about 23,000 pounds up to about 70, 70 to 75,000 pounds of milk, right? Um, and, and these were our boundaries in 2010. Jerseys are, are there, you know, not quite about half on the upper bounds, lower bounds, you know, we, we got a lot of animals out doing that by a lot. The question is, is how many have the potential to hit this upper bounds? Well, then we get into these discussions. And again, I reached out to Chad Deckow because he was his per, his perspective on this is a little bit different, but we're both going the same direction. What are the limits? Right. So there's aftershock and gold, awesome cows, you know, 70, you know, 35,000 kilos um, in the lactation. So, you know, just over 70,000 pounds, both of them just over 70,000 pounds in the record breaking lactations. Pretty good sized cows. But if you look at their PTA and EBVs, their estimated breeding values, they're not remarkable cows, right? They're okay cows, but they're not remarkable cows. And I think the question is, is who told them it was okay to make that much milk? When were they told it was okay to make that much milk? You know, when in their life did it only occur around lactation or did it, does it get set up at other times? And Bob and I used to spend a lot of time on that and we did at least one study where it, you know, we clearly demonstrated that nurture was three times greater at affecting milk chains, milk, milk differences or milk responses than, than nature, right? So in other words, nurture beat genetics. And that plays into our management. When do, you know, if heifers are born with this high capacity, does our management maintain that? Or are the detractors that take away from that? And that detractor could be respiratory, right? That we have to treat with antibiotics. And now we start to damage lungs or they just don't feel good. So they don't eat and they don't grow as well, which means, you know, we don't get that, that early life response. There's all sorts of things, right? That, that play into this. But I think it's important to recognize that they're born with a certain genetic capacity, but we've learned that we can modify that through our management. All right, so when I show you that calf that Rodrigo was hanging on to there and taking the picture of, that calf, you know, everything about that calf's life up until that point should have reinforced and enhanced her genetic capacity, right? Because we're, we're trying to help her grow as well as she can. And I think that's part of these outcomes. We just haven't quite figured out what it is, but I think it comes down to some of our management. All right, so we've got these, these Holsteins with a genetic capacity for about 75,000 pounds. We have cows in herds in central New York that are peaking around 200 pounds, right? So they're in that 44 to 46,000 pound range, really good cows, right? We don't hear about them because they're just, they just make a lot of milk and they keep going. Um, but, you know, are they capable of that 75,000 pounds? Maybe Bob would have said yes. And, um, I, I still think that way. The question is, is how many cows and what do we need to do to tell them it's okay to turn that on, right? Or not detract from it. And, um, you know, that's the, to the leads to this slide, you know, what, what detractors prevent them from realizing their genetic capacity? When do they occur? 
You know, how did they grow? Did they ever get sick? Did we give them all the nutrients they needed? Were they in a good climate, right? And you can think about heat stress, Florida heifers, Florida calves that were heat stressed in the last trimester never go as well. Um, were they in a good uterine environment, right? There's all sorts of things that play into this, but it's, it's not their DNA, it's how the DNA is told to behave, right? And I think there's a lot of management involved in that. And it starts, uh, we know now it starts before birth, but we can really enhance it after they're born. Right. That leads us to these uh, these objectives. Now, you know, so what are we going to do? Well, we want to double this. None of this has changed, folks. We want to double the body weight um, at, at weaning, birth to weaning. If you can do better. That's great. Um, but if you can at least do that, that's a pretty attainable, doable, functional goal. We want to get them pregnant somewhere, start getting them pregnant around 55 to 60 percent of mature body weight and have them pregnant by 65 um, we want to be at least 81 to 82% of mature body weight. I still have 85 on there because the dairy NRC was conservative and picked that number, but our data here at Cornell and the Spanish data, uh, where they did exact a pretty similar study, they ended up at 81. We ended up at 82% of mature size, and that was to achieve 80% of mature cow milk yield. All right. And the idea there is you're going to minimize nutrient partitioning towards growth during that first lactation. If you have them in early and lighter, they're still going to make milk. It's just a lost opportunity of, of having to pay for some growth during that first lactation. Uh, you'll hear another number coming out of Florida and Penn State where they're, they're saying as low as 60% of mature size. But, uh, you know, that, that, that doesn't fit. To me, that's still we're looking at pregnancy weights there. So I don't know where that number is coming from, but you'll see a publication coming suggesting that. And they'll say 70% is okay. I, I think that's too late based on the 20 years of me studying these, these types of data. Mature cows, you know, between 80 and 200 days in milk on, on healthy cows, not cold cows, somewhere in the third and fourth lactation. Okay, those are, those are our benchmarks. So when we started years ago, when the, the dairy NRC came out, Jim Drakeley and myself and then Bob, um, or yeah, Bob James at, at Virginia Tech was in getting ready to do a study. Um, the only point about this slide is that we did a lot of uh, body composition data, right? And that's helped us. We're building new models. The NRC is coming out. This was all used to build uh, the new NRC equations for calf and heifer growth. Um, and it, it informs some of our decision-making, right? And from some of that, Jim and I, you know, quite a few years ago now, um, from the early part of the data calculated these requirements for growth, right? And said, hey, if you want to grow faster, if you want to get up to, you know, one and a half to two pounds or better, you're going to need more energy. It's going to have to eat more. You need more protein. And it can't be the same amount of protein. You can't feed a 2020 and get them to grow faster because they're still going to be out of balance on energy and protein. You do have to physically uh, blend in more protein along with the energy to get the, to be able to meet the growth rates, right? And you'll see what that looks like here in a minute. All right. So this is for the, the milk or milk replacer fed calf, right? And those crude proteins are similar to mom's milk on a dry matter basis, right? So if we look at tissue, right, here's retained energy, right? And this sounds really complicated, but let's just say this is the amount of energy in a kilogram or in 2.2 pounds of body weight gain, right? And we got this from, from all of that body composition data. And you can see that, you know, pr prior to weaning, it's about 2.3 mcals. And we put them through the weaning process and that energy drops. And then right after weaning, it comes back up, right? And you say, okay, why did it drop? Did we do that? Did we cause a problem? Is this decrease in tissue energy a problem? because of our diet and our weaning process, or is this calf trying, are these calves trying to tell us something and inform us about maybe what their nutrient requirements should look like through this phase, right? Because you can see that once we get them through the weaning phase, they continue to increase in the energy content per unit of gain, and that's to be expected because as you get older, anybody who's gotten older, we get a little fatter as we get older, and the same thing with a calf and a heifer. So that means the energy content of the gain goes up. Well, you got to think about what tissues are being developed here. 
right? Well, what are we going to develop? We're going to develop those things. Those are rumens. We're going to develop a gastrointestinal tract. So then you have to ask the question, well, what's this tissue look like? There's not a lot of fat there. They're, they're, they're muscular mucosal tissue, right? It takes a lot of protein. It takes a lot of energy to build that protein, but it takes a lot of protein, right? So it kind of makes sense maybe that the energy content of the tissue decreases through that weaning phase because a lot of nutrients are being partitioned to the gastrointestinal tract. Sounds really complicated, I know, but that informs our decision-making process because then we get into the question of, well, what does that look like when we break it out into protein and fat? And sure enough, fat's down here and you can see that during the pre-weaning phase, fat deposition is 140 to 150 grams a day. And then during the weaning phase, it drops down to about 110. And then it increases post weaning back up to about 150 and continues to increase. Well, if you're thinking about what kind of tissue you're making, this makes sense because we're growing a gastrointestinal tract. That gastrointestinal tract doesn't have a lot of fat. It does contain a lot of protein. Well, that leads to another observation. Here's how much protein those calves have to receive to meet their tissue requirements, or this not receive, this is what they actually retain during the pre-weaning phase. But look at what they retain during the weaning phase. It's the same. And it's pretty much the same at 150. It starts to drop after that, but not a lot. Well, this is informative because a lot of times as we go to wean these calves, we put them on a starter grain that tends to be lower in crude protein and maybe not the same quality of protein as we had in the milk or milk replacer. And where I'm going with that is that I think that is part of our problem with post weaning lags is that we're not providing enough high quality amino acids to these calves through the weaning phase that allows them to adequately or efficiently build that tissue. Now, if they can't do that, even if they have energy, their feed efficiency is going to lag as they work on rumen development and build microbial protein to help offset some of that. Okay. And then you have something like this, right? Because where I'm leading to is what do we do about weaning? And here we've got a, a rumen. I've showed this picture many times. Luckily, most of us forget it. This is a calf that was growing a little over five pounds a day on milk replacer, not fed any starter, right? And to cut to the chase quite quickly, when we harvested this calf, it had a pair, it had a mate um, that was doing about the same thing. So they weren't, it wasn't isolated. Uh, but you can see here that when we opened up this rumen, there was nice and shiny, just like a baby's bottom, no papillae, doesn't look like anything's fermenting. And that was nothing fermenting because it was all sawdust. It was eat, the calf was eating its bedding. We didn't feed any dry feed. The take home point for me when I saw this was I'm feeding this calf enough milk replacer to grow at about five pounds a day. It still wants to consume dry feed. That's interesting because we keep saying now, oh, if we feed them that much milk, they're never going to want to eat any dry feed. So this kind of, you know, I know this is an N of one, but this kind of flies in the face of that idea. And I'm thinking that if we'd have put some starter in front of it, it would have consumed that starter quite readily and happily because it wants to become a ruminant. Um, and that begs the question of if we're feeding high levels of milk, why don't those calves want to consume their starter? And I think that is really then a vexing problem. Some of its behavior, right? And, you know, and I'll go through these slides fairly quickly, but I think behavior is part of the problem. They learn, and they're herd animals, they would learn to eat from their dam or they would learn from other calves around them, right? Under, under normal conditions, the calf, the dam would teach them how to eat, what to eat, right? But we probably create more barriers, right? We put them in isolation, we put them in a hutch, they can't see each other very well. Um, they're by themselves, right? That probably doesn't uh, do much for them. 
We put this little bit of starter in the bottom of a deep bucket. We know it's starter that calf has absolutely no idea what that stuff is, all right? So they don't really care unless we starve them a little bit, which for many years was our management strategy and they were hungry enough, they'd go investigate and learn how to eat it, right? You know, because minimizing nutrients from liquid feed to enhance hunger has been our strategy for years. And that's probably not ethically, morally, um, social license to sell milk uh, readily or a good idea. You know, and I, I, I put this in here, Dave saw these slides, he was laughing about this, you know, calves learn better if they're with their peers or can at least observe other herd animals, right? And all the data coming out of University of British Columbia and some other places where they study behavior is, is their focus, uh, will say this, right? They will engage in what is more risky behavior. And, you know, I live in an environment and have lived in an environment now where I see undergrads almost every day. So you just have to think about those undergrads. They probably don't go out by themselves and have too many drinks, but if they're with their peers, Yep, they'll engage in lots of risky behavior, right? Again, they behave more like herd animals in this case. So we need to create an environment that allows calves to teach each other about starter grain intake. And we need to do other things that allow them to enhance uh, their intake, right? We can add flavors and odors. And we have started doing that. Uh, and again, there's been mixed data on that but as we do more of our own work we're finding that a, a little bit of something to help them want to eat is really helpful right they they will be attracted to the starter and i've got several examples of that happy to do it in q a uh, but we i was not a big believer in that until the last five to eight years when we started refiguring starter formulations and now i'm kind of saying okay we got to do this I think the other part of this is make sure all nutrient requirements are met. It makes a starter very expensive, right? Um, by, by normal standards, right? They're not very expensive, but more expensive. I shouldn't say it like that. It's more expensive. And again, I say it's a return on investment, not a cost per day. It, you know, and our, our uh, monogastric, the folks that feed chickens and pigs, they put enzymes in those young animals. And there's probably some enzymes that we should start thinking about. We've got a bag outside my door here in my office that one of these days I'll get around to trying. But uh, I think there's things that we could do to also enhance digestibility and intake in these calves. You know, and when I see that starter intake is inhibited by high levels of milk intake, you know, and I kind of just said this starter is a food's not obvious to the calf. I will argue now that starch content is probably too high and might inhibit dry matter intake. You know, and I'll say, think, you know, think about Mike Allen's hepatic oxidation theory in subacute ruminal acidosis. I'll get to this in a minute, but I've seen starters with very high starch contents out there now. And that seems to be more of a common theme when you start analyzing the data that are just the field-based data and the literature. And I think uh, that is, that's probably part of our problem. You know, papilla and rumen function can be developed with low intakes, but it, it requires, you know, good digestible material. Full digestion requires a large pool of bacteria, and this is directly related to dry matter intake and fermentable carbohydrate intake. So eventually we do have to increase that, but I think maybe there's other ways to do it. Part of it is maybe taking time, you know, weaning protocol, increase the amount of time to wean. And this is a study where, um, again, I won't go through all the details, but they fed different amounts of milk, weaned them over time. And you can see they went one week, two weeks, three weeks. All right. And notice how they stepped down and they were six liters and 12 liters. So think quarts, six quarts, 12 quarts. So twice as much. And starter intake came right up, no difference, all right? And if you looked at body weight, those that received 12 liters had the highest body weight, so they maintained it. And I think the point here is, is really good. Take your time. You let them learn to eat. Keep feeding them a little bit of liquid feed. Don't be in such a hurry, all right? And we've adopted this, and you'll see this in a couple studies coming up. But I think part of the problem here is um, level of starch, 
right? And you should investigate this for yourselves. But if I pull some papers in the Journal of Dairy Science here, you know, over the last few years, and you look at it, the lowest was 15.6, uh, but you see them at 51, there's a 19, but a lot of them are in the high 30s, low 40s, right? And I've seen some in the field that are 48, 49, 50. Um, I think that's problematic, right? The mean content of starch in these studies was, was 38. And we would never feed that high a starch to a high producing lactating cow with a fully developed rumen. Why do we think that's okay with an underdeveloped rumen? All right, and I'm, I'm probably hitting that a little bit harder than some people would like me to, but I do think that when I see all these studies where people say, hey, we feed too much milk, we can't get them to eat their starter grain. Well, the milk hasn't changed. What has changed? Well, it's probably how much energy we're trying to get in them because we think because they don't eat a lot, we got to increase the energy content. Well, maybe we do, but maybe we've got the wrong energy source, all right? And um, I had the luxury of doing a study in Ireland with one of my PhD students. He happened to be Irish and was here on behalf of the Irish government. Um, this is an Irish pasture, you know, kind of looks like our lawns. <laughs> if we don't mow them for a couple of weeks, you know, perennial ryegrass, three leaf stage. Um, the point here is that under natural conditions, we would have this, all right? Calves suckling mom, eating some grass, doing things like that, right? And I always like to go back to nature on this stuff. So when we look at, oops, when we look at these starters, notice the sugar, or sorry, these pastures, look at the sugar content. 25% sugar on those immature pasture grasses. 1.2% starch. Right? And if you think about rumen development, we know that butyrate's the primary VFA that drives rumen development. Sugar is one of the primary promoters of that, not starch. Starch drives propionate. But butyrate's driven by sugar. Okay, And you won't get the same kind of pH changes. You won't have acidosis. There's a lot of things to this thinking that make us say, well, maybe we should do something different. So here's the, uh, here's the starter nutrient content. Again, Dave, I'll give him these slides to distribute. We balanced for all essential amino acids. We ended up just over 25% crude protein. I wasn't looking at protein. I was looking at amino acids. 21% NDF, 21% starch, 15% sugar, targeting about 2.4 pounds a day of energy and protein allowable gain, okay? There's the ingredients, again, um, not remarkable. Um, wheat mids to make a pellet, soy plus, canola, sugar, dried whey, a little bit of blood. We're using uh, Metasmart in this case to get our, our methionine, you know, a flavor enhancer, uh, some rumensin, yeast cell wall, and then that's all in a pellet. And then bee pulp shreds on externally to get some digestible fiber and some soluble fiber and a little bit of flaked corn. You could put the corn in the pellet if you wanted to. We just, I like texturized feeds as long as they're put together well, all right? We ran a couple studies. I'm not gonna give you all the details of the studies just to show you that we ran a, a B vitamin study. Our calves overall averaged 2.2 pounds a day. They averaged just over four pounds of dry matter intake. They averaged a feed efficiency over 0.5, right? And this includes the weaning. Okay, and if we look at dry matter intake, we were at 2.9 pounds per day of milk replacer intake allowed. This is kind of what they consumed, right? And then you can see one, two, three weeks we took to drop them off. And in this weaning phase, we started at seven weeks. You can see in the first week, you know, we were up to about 1.5, 1.8. And by weaning, we're up to 4.4 pounds. Notice how fast that came up, right? Pulled the milk down, they came up. It took time. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, we're at seven to eight pounds of starter intake. And there's enough NDF there to allow for chewing and rumination. Now, if you look at their growth rates, we were about 2.4 pounds a day. They did drop to 1.7 
but nobody went into negative energy balance, right? And a week later, they are up, you know, from nine weeks, eight to nine weeks, and then the 10 weeks, we're back up to over 2.4 pounds, and we settled in at three pounds a day, average daily gain post weaning. All right, and I'm showing you that because that's kind of how the formulated uh, the starter was formulated. Higher protein, we're meeting amino acids. We're also providing different forms of energy, bringing the starch down, bringing the sugar up, providing some NDF. We see nice responses. When we look at this data compared to some data coming out of uh, Europe, where they say, hey, we can't feed high levels of milk because we're going to have a crash, right? Well, you don't have to. I think it depends on what the starter looks like and, and what kind of nutrients we put in front of them. I think that's really important. And we've kind of ignored that. Starter formulation has is, is kind of been low cost, inexpensive ingredients. You know, we'll keep the protein up there, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. And I think that's probably partly what's causing us problems, right? Because if you, we can feed more milk replacer, we can get higher growth, we can wean them effectively. We don't see this big uh, negative energy balance and they come out of it doing great, right? And I think that's the point here is that we have to start thinking differently. These guys are actually advocating chopping straw and putting it in all our starters. Well, when you stop, when me as a nutritionist, I think about that and say, well, the straw is no good. It has no energy. Why are we doing that? Well, one reason to do that is to dilute out the starch, <laughs> right? Just, just drop the starch, All right? We ran another study evaluating amino acids, um, all methionine. You know, we looked at HMBI, HMTBA, and room protected methionine compared to a control. This is a picture of the starter, All right? Same kind of formulation. In this case, we were using uh, vanilla from Adiseo, but still the bee pulp, some flake corn, a little bit of molasses to keep the, the dust down, right? But the same kind of, uh, same kind of ingredients, a little whey, a little blood meal. We have a European formula without the blood meal and the animal proteins uh, that we can share if somebody would want that. And again, we, we end up you know, around 25% protein. NDF around 21, starch around 20, Sugars in that 15% and soluble fiber are actually quite high thanks to the uh, thanks to the, the beet pulp, right? And ME is about the same. And it's it's the same kind of response. We find this really fascinating. Milk replacer comes up, and then we take three weeks to, to knock it down, and the starter comes right up, right? And if we look at our starter intake, we're only looking at about a quarter of a pound pre-weaning, but because of all that sugar, that's plenty to get good rumen function through the weaning period. It comes up nicely. We're at 1.8 pounds and immediately post weaning, you know, we're averaging almost seven pounds of intake. So I, this tells me that maybe we need to modify our starters. Maybe we need to take a little bit more time in the weaning process and that we can have good weaning and not have post weaning slump and not have to pull out the AS 700 <laughs> to overcome uh, all of our respiratory disorders that occur uh, through that transition phase from pre-weaning to weaning, all right? And the same kind of thing, if we look at the average daily gains up, down, up, right? We still, we would like to get rid of this little drop here. We'd like to flatten it out. We're gonna figure out how to do that, hopefully. But if you look at the average daily gains, 2.2, 1.7, 2.9. So these girls are doing pretty well, right? And we, we are happy with this. Again, we'd like to do better. I'd like to keep this closer to two through this weaning period. And one of these days we'll figure out how to do it, okay? Doubling the birth weight, you know, by seven weeks and tripling the birth weight by 13 weeks. That's kind of where we've been, uh, at least with our research. We're not doing that on a herd basis yet, but we're not really trying that hard at the moment. Okay, I've got some slides here about the feeding program. I got a lot of words. I'm gonna make sure that these are shared with all of you because um, I don't wanna take the time to go through all of this detail. Uh, if we were in a room having a conversation, I would probably do it, but just to read off my slides, I think is, uh, is a little bit defeating right now in the interest of time and all of that, but um, it's there. Again, I'll make sure it gets 
shared with you. So just to close out this calf part, um, calves have more growth potential than we're allowing them to realize, right? We've known that for a long time, um, but I think as we get more information about requirements and weaning efficiency, we're learning that we can do even better. Weaning management needs to evolve to allow for good rumen development prior to milk yield, or trying to, prior to milk removal, sorry. Um, uh, you know, and I, I think uh, it's just really time, you know, right right now, I think if we just took our time, did it a, a little more patience with uh, this process that we wouldn't have some of the train wrecks that we have post weaning, right? But I do think while we're doing that, we probably have to evolve our, our uh, starter formulation to, to meet the tissue requirements, encourage feed intake and promote growth, right? Because intake is ultimately going to be our friend in this. But I think to make that all happen, the, the nutrient profile probably has to change a little bit. And that's going to cost a little bit more, right? Um, but if you're buying AS700, and you're treating with high expensive antibiotics for respiratory that maybe that should be turned into a little bit more time, a little better feed, things like that. All right. Cause I think that's, I, I think we're, we are, our interest to be low cost and be in a hurry is probably getting us into trouble. And I, you know, 15 years, I, I never would have said that, but I'm, we're all learning. I keep learning and my colleagues are challenging me because they've kind of come across the same thing. And we just kind of said, maybe we're moving too fast, but we've also got to make the starters more available. They've got to realize that that starter is feed and there's probably lots of ways to do that, but you know, getting something to make it attractive is important. So I'll spend the last few minutes here on post weaning factors that I think are out there um, and detract from milk production. Cause I do see really good, you know, I mean, that, that was, maybe that sounded a little bit more negative. It wasn't in sign, maybe critical. I think we're doing a fantastic job, but weaning to me is still one of those things that is, is holding us back. And we struggle, the industry struggles with weaning in some regards. So that's why I wanted to address that. But calf programs, heifer programs in general, for the most part, really good. All right. So, so where do things fall down? Well, I think they fall down uh, once we get them pregnant. Part of the problem is, is that we don't weigh anything, right? And uh, this has been a, a lifelong problem. <laughs> Not sure I'll fix it. It's probably the most important measure we could make on a cow other than knowing her milk weight. And in a heifer, it's the only measure we can make that means anything. Uh, being alive doesn't count. Knowing what her weight is, is more important. And I, we have to also recognize that as we breed for more milk, although the geneticists are trying to fix this now, we generally make a bigger machine, right? And, and anybody who's walked into a barn built in the 1940s or 50s and looked at the stall size versus the stalls we have now and the cows we have now, you, you can tell. You don't need a lot of science background to say, gee, the stalls were really small in the 1940s. I wonder why that was. Well, it's because the cows were a lot smaller. Our herd in 1993, the mature size, our research herd was 1472. In 2016, we weighed them, it's 1770. And, and, and some of you saw this in a workshop we had a couple years ago um, with all the extension group because they had gone out and, and done a bunch of this work, right? But just a reminder that, that that's, that's important, right? Because I don't think we still get it right. And then if you look at this body weight, all right, in this case, this just happened to be part of a research project, you know, the mature cows versus the heifers, the heifers are 79% of the mature body weight. And within that structure, they were 78% of the mature cow milk production. And having looked at this for 20 years, I can tell you that if I know the mature size and what weight they're coming in, relative to the mature size post calving, I can pretty much tell you how they're going to be milky because it's all within a unit or two of that mature size. Because if they're lighter, they're gonna be partitioning more nutrients towards growth and that growth value is pretty well understood. And, and it's, that's gonna be the equivalent amount of energy that won't be going into the milk pail, right? And again, there's 20 years, I've got 20 years of data looking at this 
Um, and again, it's not that the cows or the heifers won't make milk, they're making milk and they might be making okay milk, but they could be doing better if we got them to grow prior to calving just a little bit more, right? Get them to grow to that 80, 82% of mature size, 81% of mature size. Where I see that falling down is here. Do you have a pregnant heifer group, right? And everybody should raise their hand and say, yes, of course I have a pregnant heifer group. And then I'll ask the question, do you have a late pregnant heifer group? And most people would say, no, why the heck would you have one of those? And I'm not advocating that everybody go make one of these, but I am advocating that I think maybe this is where we're losing some milk, right? And it's that opportunity. What happens? Well, our fetal requirements increase in that third trimester. Mammary development accelerates in that third trimester. Growth requirements are still high. And we got to consider liver hypertrophy and colostrum production, right? It's all going to start to happen as this animal in this third trimester gets closer to lactation. In a very old slide, here's the energy requirement in an ME basis for pregnancy. And notice, and you can see this kind of bluish line here, notice that there's, there's nothing really out here, right? It's not this line. It's not this line. It's that dark line. And notice that it looks like somebody just turned on a switch. There's a little bit of a tail here, but it's only a few days, right? And it seems like once they hit that third trimester, all of a sudden, you know, you, we've built the calf, now we're going to give it a birth weight, right? So all of a sudden, we're going to build that calf from something the size of a softball to what we see coming out at parturition, right? And the energy requirement for that goes up precipitously starts at 191 days or the third trimester. The same thing happens for protein, right? We go from basically no requirement for protein to about 190 grams a day required of absorb protein. If we don't account for that in our diets, what generally happens is the calf keeps growing. Mom's gonna take care of the calf, but mom stops growing. And we've got that modeled in the CNCPS. So here I've got a 1200 pound heifer with a 1770 pound mature weight, 180 days pregnant at the end of the second trimester, right? Target gain of 3.1, Energy allowable gain at 3.1, MP allowable gain of 4.2. And you just say, wow, those numbers look really high. Well, they are because I'm thinking about the next phase, right? Because I know that very clearly here, we're going to hit that third trimester and things are going to change. But notice that energy is balanced with the gain, which includes the weight of pregnancy, the fetal growth, and protein's actually a little bit in excess. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make them 200 days pregnant. So they're in the third trimester and I'm gonna give them just a little bit of body weight, all right? So we went to up about 70 pounds. We went 20 days more pregnant. Our target gain is 3.6 pounds a day because now we've got more pregnancy weight. Energy went to 2.6, protein went to 2.1. So all of a sudden these heifers in this third trimester between mom and baby should be growing at about three and a half pounds a day. We only have enough nutrients there for about 2.1 to 2.6 and protein is gonna be first limiting, which means our growth rates are gonna slow down. It's not, the calf is not gonna get bigger. The calf is gonna keep doing what the calf is supposed to do. Mom's gonna take care of the calf. Mom is not going to grow as well. So we have more potential for postpartum problems or more calving ease. Um, but we're not going to grow as well. And I've seen this around the world. I've seen this in, in Northern Europe. I've seen this in Italy. I've seen this in China, where we feed these calfers a dry cow diet that's not formulated for their intakes or energy requirements. And the heifer, especially the high fill diets, and the heifers come in and the complaint from all the dairymen are no colostrum, poor startup milks, all this kind of stuff. Well, that's because they've got so much tough to make up that they couldn't do in that last trimester. So we need to consider a diet that meets their needs, might make us think that we need another group, right? So we don't have to feed more nutrients to everybody. But I think 
Um, one of the things that I've seen is improving the nutrient supply during this period will help overcome poor colostrum production and some of the overall lower milk yields in the first lactation because the heifers are going to be better at achieving that 81 to 82 percent of mature size and not have to grow and make up for the growth uh, during lactation. This is really where I see a lot of herds falling down because if you if you don't do well, you see something like this, right? If you miss it, mess it up, you see something like this. And we've seen this, this herd was 69% of the mature cows. And you know, over the last six years, at least 22 herds have been, had the same kind of problem, not as low as that, but same kind of problem. It's a lot of money, right? Because if you do the margin on that, and you assume your 800 cow herd with 40% first lactation heifers, that's, Income over feed costs, that's $68,000, $69,000 or $86 per cow, right? Or $215 per income over feed for lactating heifers. That's, that's quite a bit, especially, and this is not at high milk price, right? $1,680. So, so we can do that. So this is kind of like a net farm income difference, right? Income over feed cost. Heifers can do well, right? Here's a herd where heifers are producing at 82% of the mature cows, a 2X herd, no BST, no rumensin, 88 pounds of milk, okay? So we need to do better with our heifers. Um, that late pregnant stage can be a problem, okay? If there's any time left, I'll take some questions. Okay, Mike, can you hear me? I can hear you, David. Okay, great. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, apologize for our technical problems. I won't get into the details, but glad we got it working. So if there's any questions, if people could type them into the Q&A. Um, let's see here. Um, so here's a question from Phil. Uh, which is better to promote growth in calves? Pasteurized whole waste milk or... Uh, went away. Well... I think that, so I don't know if there's a better, yeah, so I, I can guess that pasteurized or, whole or waste higher milk. protein milk replacer. That's right. Yep. I think you, I think the, my, my answer to that is you just need to understand what nutrients you're putting into them and make sure if that you standardize the nutrients. Pasteurized waste milk is almost always going to be higher in fat. So in terms of the energy content, it's always going to contain more energy than the milk replacer. But if you feed a little bit more of the milk replacer to equal the energy content, the growth should be the same. So I don't think it's a it's a either or there. I think if you do it as a nutritionist would and, and not, you know, sometimes we get into the volume thing, right? I'm going to feed a gallon of this or a gallon of that. Well, if you just think it on a volume basis, then the milk's probably going to win. But if you feed it on a nutrient basis, they're probably closer to even than you might expect. Okay. Next question, could the possible nutrient deficit in third trimester pregnant heifers, heifers cause subclinical metabolic disease? That's a really good question and one that I'd like to research. I think it does. I think it does because some of those heifers I've seen, I've seen some heifer, I've seen a lot of heifers on these, you know, the Goldilocks high fill diets, man, they're, they're protein deficient you know, MP limited by two, three, 400 grams. It's some, I've seen some really severe cases. They didn't make any colostrum. They, they're not ready to go and they got to get into lactation. And all of a sudden, you know, they're, then they got a high metabolic demand to make milk. Those heifers have been at odds with a lot of things. So yes, I think it's possible. These heifers are so resilient. This is my observation. It just seems that we, we just tend to suffer in milk production. In early right. lactation, which is right, Joe. There, basically, yeah, yeah. Right, but they could, they could, if if things are not right, they they could be sick. I've seen some oh, sick yeah. heifers, and it's hard to explain why. And but you got to go back to that early period. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. I think we're going to stop. I know you've got to connect with your folks from Canada. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, Tremendous uh, amount of great information, some real food for thought from a standpoint of a, uh, a uh, like a pre-fresh uh, first calf heifer group uh, and the benefits that may be able to be gained from there. So um, again, thanks very much. Sure. What we're do, what we're thanks, do Carwin. Now, okay. No problem, Mike. <laughs> what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, show uh, slides.
we'll run through because we're a little bit late here of all of our sponsors and we certainly appreciate um, all of their support. And then uh, I'll introduce Corwin and uh, he'll kick it off with uh, this whole question of older cows making more milk and making more money. Okay, thank you. And Eric Smith is uh, connected. He is our field crop specialist who is connected in another location. And let's see if he can get the slide set going here so we can give our sponsors the recognition that they deserve. There we go. Okay, so uh, we're running a couple of minutes behind here. I see uh, Corwin is connected. You should be able to uh, bring up your presentation, I believe, Corwin. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, just a second here. So, uh, so very quickly, uh, many of you probably know Corwin Holtz. He's uh, uh, a principal in uh, the Holtz Nelson uh, Dairy Consultant Group. Uh, he resides in uh, Dryden. Uh, he's been a Cornell mainstay for many years in his earlier career. 
In fact, I see Cornell up on the wall there behind him, above that picture of some cows or heifers. So anyway, uh, I will make it just brief and leave it at that. Uh, he's got a group of great group of folks that he works with on nutrition and uh, dairy management consulting, um, not only in New York, but in the Northeast, um, spilling over into Vermont and New England. Is it coming up? Yep, there we go. Okay, you have it on your end there, David? Um, not yet. Uh, hold on. Hmm. Eric, can you hear me? You probably can. All right. Yeah, uh, Corwin, so you shared your, um, did you share the presentation itself? I thought I had here, just a second. You might have to go up to the top um, where it has your screen share. There might be some options or maybe your, your view uh, at the top might have uh, display settings. You see that anywhere? Uh, boy. Let me get out of. Try to get rid of some stuff here. <laughs> Okay, we're going to try to share again here. Can you see my screen at all? Oh, here we go. Yep, now we see it. It's coming up. There, there we, go. we go. Perfect. We got, it. we got it. Super. All right. Thanks so very much for the help there. Sorry about that. We're good. All right. You should be able to take it away right now. All right, Dave, thank you. Well, I appreciate the invite. Uh, this has actually been a, a uh, pet project of mine, working with my clients over the last few years, uh, looking at uh, the demographics of herds and what our, our makeup in terms of the lactation status of our cows is uh, across a herd. And I think there's a lot of factors that I'll go through uh, relative to not just having an older herd, uh, potentially making more milk, but what are some of the other ramifications that come along with that? And I think they are all tied together. It's not simply a matter of just having an older, an older herd, a more productive mature cow herd, but other issues that go along with it. So my challenge today is to, to get you to think uh, a little bit about, uh, are you actively managing the age of your herd? Um, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about call rate. Uh, I'm going to talk about quite a bit about uh, what the heifer herd size is that you're dealing with and how those really impact what the average age and lactation number of a herd uh, might be. And then tying that into, are we milking the most profitable cows we can? Uh, Mike talked a lot about cost of raising these heifers. I'm gonna get into some of that. And we always have to remember that it takes that heifer uh, at least a full lactation, maybe a lactation and a half in many cases, to actually pay for her cost of rearing. So these mature cows are really, at the end of the day, the cows that are gonna be the most profitable cows day in and day out uh, for any herd. The factors that, that I see influencing the, the age of a herd really boil down to just a few things. 
what's the call rate of your herd, of your milking herd, and what does that look like from a voluntary versus involuntary call rate, and also, you know, what, what's the death rate in a herd, and then what's your heifer inventory, and those two are tied very, very closely together. Now, the one thing that always needs to be kept in mind is that uh, we can have two different conversations about this topic if we're talking about a static size herd or if we're talking about a growing herd. A growing herd just by its nature is generally going to be bringing in more uh, first and in some cases maybe second lactation animals just for growth purposes. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is really if you're in a static herd size situation, uh, what can this uh, culling and heifer inventory really mean in terms of what the herd demographics uh, look like and what that impact has on, on potential profitability uh, of the herd? So just to go through some numbers here, and, and I looked up a lot of different uh, sources to kind of see what call rates uh, look like around the country and here in the Northeast in particular. And it just doesn't seem to matter where I go to find data, whether it be uh, through USDA data from back in, as you see in 2018, uh, total call rate between uh, cows cold and, and cows that died, 37.5%. Uh, Another uh, uh, DRMS uh, evaluation of Pennsylvania herds had it at 37%. Uh, I went back to a conference that was held uh, a few years ago by De Laval, and you can see there that uh, uh, seven, uh, almost 18% uh, of those herds, and this is over, this is over 12,000 herds, averaged 21% uh, call rate. The ma vast majority of the herds in that study, uh, right at that 37, 38% call rate. But an interesting uh, fact is that 11% of those herds are over averaging 55% call rate, uh, which is really unfathomable to me. Uh, some other data I came across here recently, uh, some 2018-19 data here in the Northeast. Her, the, they broke the, group, the herds out into less than 41 months of age. They averaged 38 months of age. And then a group that was uh, uh, greater than 44 months of age and they averaged 47 months of age. And the interesting thing in those younger herds, those call rates ran in that 37 to 42% range, where the older herds, uh, their call rates ran uh, less than 32. Um, so the numbers line up very, very, uh, you know, uh, dramatically that these 37, 38, 40 plus percent call rates lead to younger herds. There's just no way, no way around the math that goes into those calculations. A little more breakdown of some of this uh, uh, call rate data. Um, voluntary calling is broken into voluntary and, and involuntary calling. Uh, poor production uh, headed, headed the list uh, for voluntary calling, but I think that's always a number that we kind of have to question at times. Is that cow a poor producer because she didn't get bred on time, she got late in lactation, and she's just way too far out there in days and milk. So I think a lot of these, what we classify in, in record keeping under poor production, really in many cases are probably a function of other issues that may be going on with, with individual cows in some cases. Uh, dairy sales, a little less than 5%. Uh, mean, it's always interesting to go in through uh, dairy comp uh, records and 
see what uh, what's written down for those kind of cows. Uh, some things you can't say in public necessarily. Uh, and then involuntary calling, repro, repro leads the list. No question about it. I see that as, as very much the common situation followed by mastitis and then lameness. And then uh, some other categories there under, under 5% being injuries, DAs, et cetera. This died number, um, as I work with my clients, you know, our goal is to have that number uh, down in the three to no more than 5% on a yearly basis. And talking to veterinarians, that 5% cutoff number is, is kind of where they uh, definitely want to have a, a top level number for, for percent died. I tend to look at percent died in a herd as uh, number died over number of freshenings in the herd for a year's period of time. That just gives me a very uh, level playing field herd versus herd to be able to look at that number. But I've definitely got some clients that are well under under 3%, some running uh, actually less than 2%. But that that 5 to 8 to 9% is a very, very common uh, died number that, that I see across the industry. So how do we minimize these calls? And these are just some of the things that I talk to my clients about uh, that uh, I think really are the key factors in minimizing cows going out of a herd for reasons uh, that they shouldn't be going out of a herd. First of all, I'm, I'm a, just a huge proponent of anything we can do for, for cow comfort. We know in the Northeast here that we do overcrowd our facilities in the vast majority of the cases. But when we do that, do we have usable stalls? Uh, is every stall in that pen of high quality and usable? Uh, do we minimize the time away from, from uh, free stalls and, and, and feed? Uh, can we get cows in and out of the parlor as quickly as possible? Uh, in these overcrowded situations. And then I think one thing that I just don't think we have looked at enough over the years uh, when we talk about all this cow comfort uh, data is actual square footage within a pen. And I know in, in barns that my clients are building over the last few years, just widening uh, feed alleys, widening uh, back alleys, uh, increasing the number of crossovers in a pen, increasing the size of those crossovers. All those things have led to uh, more square footage per cow. And I think there's a lot of positives to that. I can go into a, a, a pen of cows at 60 square feet per cow and feel very cramped, but I can walk in with the same percent of overcrowding in terms of cows to stalls into a pen just because the alleys are bigger, the crossovers are bigger, et cetera. And we might be up to 70 to 75 square feet per cow. And it's a whole different feeling in that pen relative to the overcrowding uh, feeling. Transition cow programs, Mike talked about this a little bit as far as the heifers go. To me, that's where it all starts. Uh, you guys all know that. Uh, you deal with it day to day from a metabolic and startup milk standpoint. Uh, nutrition plays a key. Uh, cow comfort, overcrowding. If we're gonna uh, any place in the in the system that we're gonna undercrowd or not overcrowd, it's definitely in those pre-fresh and fresh cow pens. And then does that result in, in 60 day call rates of, of less than 5%? And, and there are herds out there that are certainly down in that three to three to four percent on a regular basis. So it can be done. Milk quality, you know, not getting rid of cows because of mastitis, uh, keeping somatic cell count down, uh, daily clinical cases less than a percent and a half. Uh, some herds ran easily less than a percent. Repro, 
Can we run preg rates greater than 25%? Can we, and as a result of that, can we keep the herd at 150 to 170 70 days in milk on a regular basis? That's just gonna minimize that percent of the herd that's low production, late lactation cows, and minimize those heavy cows, potential heavy cows that got out there too far days in milk because of poor repro. And then we end up having potential problems when those cows calve back in uh, just because of excess body condition. And then of course, foot health, and you're gonna have uh, Charles talking about uh, that in another session of this meeting, uh, <clears throat> but just routine and proper trimming, foot bath protocols, and then what kind of surfaces are those cows traveling on day in and day out. So does, there, does have, uh, changing subjects here a little bit, we've gotten through the calling. Now to go to this whole discussion of heifers. And does heifer inventory influence culling and er, uh, herd age? And I, I propose that it very much does in a lot of, in a lot of herds. And we in, in the industry have had a mentality of, for many generations of, we have to raise every heifer. And I really challenge my clients day in and day out, is this the profitable thing to do in a static, not growing herd? I propose that it's not a profitable thing to do and we'll go through some numbers to uh, elucidate that a little bit more. But in general, if a barn can only handle so many cows, then if we've got heifers coming in or overcrowding becomes you know, much more of a challenge. The older cows are the ones that go. That's just the way it happens. And again, those heifers coming in, they've still got a year, a year and a half to pay for themselves versus that mature cow that maybe gets pushed out uh, and, and, and shouldn't have to be pushed out just because we need the space for heifers coming in. I, I grant that in theory, uh, those heifers should be genetically superior, but again, do we need every last heifer uh, that potentially is born on the farm? And here in the Northeast, as many of you uh, are experiencing, and I know quite a few of my clients are, now we have these base production programs that uh, are really putting a a different dynamic on you know, how much milk we can ship out. Uh, should we may be making that milk with the most uh, profitable cows in the herd? I think we should, and, and those are gonna be the older population cows. So some heifer rearing costs, and many of you have, have seen this data. I think it's, I, I, I sincerely believe it's real. Um, this is the last uh, Cornell data on the top here. Uh, variable cost of 1990, fixed cost of 319. On average, costing $2,300 to get a heifer into milk with a range of uh, uh, not quite $2,100 up to upwards of $2,600. And I, I looked around for some other data sets and uh, most recent one, some data out of University of Wisconsin, right there with the Cornell data, 2240 at 24 months of age. And I, I know there's other data sets out there that are gonna agree with those numbers day in and day out. So these heifers are not cheap to raise uh, by, by any stretch of the imagination. Even if we take the fixed costs out, and those fixed costs are real. They're there every day. We have to deal with them. But those variable costs are still basically $2,000 per heifer. Not all cash cost. I, I recognize that. But still, um, they are true costs um, that have to be incurred over time in one fashion or another, whether it's raising crops to, to grow those heifers um, 
uh, additional labor that may not be need to be there uh, for all the heifers that, that a person's raising. Uh, just a lot of a lot of different variable costs that go into that equation. That if we weren't raising every last heifer, can we can we potentially save some money? Also, the thing to always remember is when do those costs really? When are they the the majority of them? Uh, costing you and that's in that milk fed phase and then simply because of dry matter intake levels uh, as they get out there close to calving. Um, so the discussion that I have with many of my clients is if we're going to reduce our, our heifer numbers, the most profitable time to reduce them is at the time that we're incurring the most expense on that animal and I, I say that that's during that milk fed uh, weaning phase uh, when it is most expensive, whether we calculate on a dollars per day basis or a per pound of, of gain basis. So how do we manage these heifer numbers? And many of you may be doing some of these things and it's certainly something that I'm having continual discussions with my clients. Uh, I have a lot of clients and a lot of dairymen in the Northeast anymore are selling calves at birth. If you don't need the numbers, uh, the best time to get rid of those calves is early in life that we're not putting the cost of feed, milk replacer, whole milk, uh, grain, et cetera, and the labor that goes along with all that. Uh, we might as well get rid of them at birth and, and save that, that very expensive uh, uh, growth stage in those calves. A lot more discussion, and many of you are probably doing this. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, strategic use of sex semen and beef semen. I have some clients that are just breeding heifers to sex semen and then maybe first service uh, to all the cows with sex semen. And then after that, all the cows get beef semen. Um, you can sit down and make those calculations. Uh, how many heifers do we need in a year's period of time? Uh, we're gonna get so many heifers via sex semen. And uh, if we can set up a system where we can get value out of those beef calves, uh, becomes a win-win situation. Uh, there are some, uh, not a lot, but a few that aren't raising heifers at all. They have found a strategic partner to purchase Springers or fresh first and second lactation cows from, and uh, they've just gotten out of the heifer, heifer rearing business altogether. Not saying that's an easy thing to do relative to finding that strategic partner, but there are certainly uh, people that are out there uh, making that making that approach to success. One question I always get is, well, should we be genomic testing? And believe me, I'm, I'm a big believer in genomics, uh, no question about it. But it takes time to get those genomic results back. You've got two or you've got three to four weeks generally of raising that calf, even if you tested that calf on day of birth. Uh, before you get those results back, um, you know, and if you, when you do get those results back, or you're making decisions to call those low genomic, genomic uh, calves right away, um, or is there other ways to use uh, dam and sire, just basic genetic information uh, to make decisions on who's going to go and who's going to stay at birth? I don't have a single answer to that. Uh, like I say, there's, there's different ways of doing it and, and certainly uh, successful uh, across the board, but uh, uh, something that you need to think about relative to how do you make decisions on which calves to, to keep and which calves to, to have go early in life. So raising heifers to me is more, uh, is more than just the cost, uh, raising these excess heifers more than just the cost. If we're overcrowding our facilities, 
Uh, we're compromising heifer growth. We're compromising heifer health. I see this continually where heifer facilities are just, we think we're crowding our cows a lot. The heifer, heifers are crowded even more. Um, some recent Penn State data. Now those calves one to six months of age, uh, no pneumonia cases are one, one and a half times more likely to survive to 24 months. Um, health compromised calves and heifers, uh, they're at a higher risk of being cold during first lactation. And in general, those are your lower milk first lactation animals. Again, if that cow barn is full, uh, generally the decision is we got to push out older, in my opinion, more, more productive older cows. So how many heifers do you need? And that's really, again, we're going to talk about this from a static herd size. A growing herd situation is a different discussion, no question about it. But from a static herd size, how many heifers you need is really a function of what age are you calving heifers in at, what's the lactating herd call rate, and what is the non-completion rate of your heifer herd? That's heifers that either die and are, are, are called before uh, calving. So this is a very simple equation. It works. And I'll go through a couple of examples here. So if we had a 300 cow herd, uh, 24 months age of first calving, and a 40% call rate, and a 10% non-completion rate on our heifer program, we would need 264 heifers, total heifers, from day one to ready to calve today. We're going to need 264 heifers to keep that herd at a continual 300 cow herd size or 88% of our total herd size. If we take that age at first calving down by just a month and lower our call rate to 35% from 40%, keep the same non-completion rate, we take our heifer needs down by uh, 40, 43 heifers, down to 221 heifers or 73.5% of our 300 cow herd size. $1,900, though that was the variable cost we had out of that Cornell study. Uh, 43 heifers left uh, over a two year period, that's $82,000 or almost $41,000 a year in less, less heifer rearing variable, variable cost. Not all cash costs, I completely understand that, but still the dollars are meaningful and they're real. And again, this is just a month age, month of age at first calving sooner and a reduction in our call rate of our milking herd of, of 5%. So from heifers, the question then becomes, do mature cows really make make more milk and are they more profitable? This is a, uh, this is a, a real herd. This is one of my clients, uh, 220 cows going through the barn. This is a pretty typical test day for this herd. It's a 90 pound plus herd day in and day out. Um, <clears throat> you can see the peak milks there. And the weighted average of the second and third and greater lactations are 122 and a half pounds of uh, peak milk. First lactation uh, peak milk is at 82 and a half percent of those mature cows. And I think Mike brought, a, brought that up in his uh, presentation. Uh, we definitely need these first lactation heifers performing it at 80 plus percent and hopefully closer to that 82 uh, plus number in terms of milk and peak milk uh, versus our older cows. So the average age of this herd right now is 46 months. Uh, lact average lactation number is 2.4. 
You see 37% first lactation animals. This herd has grown over the last year. That's a number that I would hope in another year, year and a half, we have that number down maybe in the low 30s versus the 37 and do end up with a more mature herd and get that average age of the herd up to 47, 48 months and average lactation number up to two and a half to 2.6. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, if we go back and look at literature, old literature, recent literature, all is the same. One pound of peak is 200 to 250 pounds of increased lactation yield. So in, this previ in that, that previous slide, our mature cows were outdoing our first lactation animals by, by 21 pounds of peak. So that's 4,200 pounds of additional lactation yield for those mature cows. So just a couple of scenarios here. If we have that 220 cow herd at 35% versus at 35% versus 40% first lactation animals, we've got 11 more mature cows in there or uh, uh, 46,000 pounds more milk per year or 46200 weights. That's a, just shy of $8,000 of additional gross revenue just because we had more mature cows in the herd. If we went down to a 30% two-year-olds versus 40%, we've got 22 more mature cows in that herd. Malkin, the same number of cows, 220. But now we've got double that. We've got almost $15,800 of additional gross revenue. Again, just by not having uh, this young, young herd. Um, and that doesn't take into account the fewer heifers that we have to raise in this lower call rate scenario, this lower first lactation scenario versus a higher percent of, of mature cows. I think the other thing we always need to keep in mind, and this is a, a term that gets thrown around more and more in our industry, we don't get paid on feed efficiency, but feed efficiency is still a number that means something. You know, how, how many pounds of energy corrected milk can, can a cow put out uh, for every pound of dry matter intake that she's uh, consuming? And we know that nutrients that are going to a first and second lactation animal, part of those nutrients are going are going to growth, not all to milk, like we will be having in a mature cow. So there's no question, a younger herd is less efficient from a feed efficiency standpoint than a mature cow herd, simply because of the growth requirements of those younger animals relative to dry matter intake. Finish up here uh, with some numbers. This is uh, this came out of a study from uh, by Zoetis. This was a compilation of uh, about ninety herds uh, out in the Midwest over a ten-year period. And one of the things that they looked at um, uh, among a, amongst a multiple of, of management issues was uh, the age and percent first lactation versus uh, percent mature cows in these herds. This data was really an eye opener for me when I first saw it a few years ago. And I think it kind of sums up. Uh, you, can, you can argue the numbers maybe here and there, uh, where feed prices are, where milk prices are, et cetera. But you see a 3.3 pound difference there on those, on those uh, older, uh, less, less uh, first lactation animal herd. And when they go through all the calculations, do the revenue, what those replacements are costing on a per day basis is in a thousand cow herd. 
and then the income, you can see that there is a significant difference in income over dry cows and feed and replacements uh, between that older herd versus the younger herd. Income after feed, dry cows and replacements of uh, over $4,800 versus $3,500 in that uh, younger, younger herd. Uh, this data is being updated uh, as we speak. And as, as uh, the author there, Mike Lorimore with Zoetis, he's actually going to be presenting this at the upcoming Herd Health and Nutrition Conference and going to be giving us an update on this, uh, on this study as they have continued to monitor uh, these, these 90 plus herds. Uh, over the last few years uh, from, from where this data set has uh, originally came from. So my take homes are at what, you know, I, the challenge that I have is at what rate are cows leaving your herd? And, and then of course, uh, just as importantly is, is why. Uh, can facilities or management changes decrease uh, the, the profile of and, and why and what cows are being culled. I really challenge you to sit down and take a hard look at how many heifers do you really need to raise relative to where you are in your herd size, your cull rate. Um, do they all need to be raised uh, as we have traditionally done in the past? Are you compromising your heifers by by having them overcrowded, raising again every last one. And then go in and take a look, see what the peaks and the daily milk is uh, differences are. <coughs> oh, excuse me, between those first lactation cows and mature cows in your herd. And uh, when you add all that up, how can these differences in call rate and needed and raised heifers and increased milk uh, have a potential impact on farm profitability. I know with the clients that I'm working with that are taking a hard look at these things, it's really been an eye opener for them. Got a lot of clients that, uh, you know, depending on herd size, uh, you know, we might have been raising 40, 40 calves a month and we know we only need 25 now and, and that's what we're raising. I uh, had another uh, a, a client make the comment to, the, to me the other day. In his case, we did all the math. He's, he's needing to raise 16 calves a month. And that's figuring a, uh, I think we figured a 10% uh, non-completion rate for his heifer program. And this is in a 600 cow herd. So 16 calves a month. So the question was asked by somebody else, well, you know, what if you only have 14 calves, you know, coming in or heifers coming in for a month, you know, you're too short. And, and to me in this day and age, my answer to that is very, very easy. My clients can go out and buy springers and or first and second lactation animals anywhere from $1,200 to $1,800. If they've got a slot that they need to fill, a hole that needs to be filled for whatever reasons, they can probably go out and buy an animal cheaper than what they could raise uh, that, that last heifer for. So I think there are a lot of ways to look at this, but uh, I think it's an opportunity for many producers to uh, increase profitability by decreasing some of the expense that we have in high call rates and raising more heifers than what we what we need. So with that, uh, be happy to ask any, answer any questions, Dave. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. It gave me a good chance to sit down and put my thoughts together and uh, uh, on something that I really feel has opportunity for a lot of producers. Thank you. Okay, Corwin, thank you very, very much. Uh, if people got questions, uh, please type them in to <laughs> Q&A. Uh, while we're waiting to see if there's any questions here, I just want to let you know that uh, when we conclude, you're going to have an evaluation questionnaire that's going to pop up. Uh, please take a minute to, uh, to fill that out. 
Believe it or not, we do read those. We value that uh, information and it helps us to, to plan in the future. Um, I guess while we're seeing if there's any questions here, I guess I'd make the comment uh, when I looked at your list, Corwin, of, uh, of the reasons these cows of uh, leaving the herd, um, with the exception of mastitis, which we had some, some of that topic covered last year at our Dairy Day program, um, having hoof care and foot health uh, on the program on Thursday, I think uh, hits the mark. I see that as a big issue for, for a lot of herds, uh, dealing with lameness and uh, problems with hoof care. Uh, 